120 that we saw in Acts chapter 1, to be overwhelmed, right? Thousands have been added to the church. The Lord is adding each and every day to the church. Their schedules packed daily devotional. They're supplying the needs of those that are around them. They are sharing meals with one another. Now we see later on in Acts, I think it's Acts chapter 6, that there's certainly organization and structure that was needed for the early church. But at this point, in the midst of their packed schedules, they're not finished. They're going to continue. But when one is reading the book of Acts, one could rightly say, how can they truly continue on? They have over 3,000 people in the church, and it's growing daily. It would be easy for them to forget their purpose. And similar with us as individuals, right? Similar for us as individual Christians, and even for the church, the local church. You see, as individuals... Individual Christians, we have busy schedules. You have busy lives. It's easy to forget why God has saved us. As a church family, as individuals that come together and as a part of the First Baptist Church of Carmi, it is easy in the midst of all that happened with COVID and all the distractions that happened over the past year. It's easy for our church to lose interest. It's easy for us to become distracted or to even forget what we have been purposed to do and to even lose interest in our motivation. Why we are doing what we are supposed to do. Well, in our passage that we're going to see this morning, we're going to see that the radical purpose that God had given the apostles back in Acts chapter 1, we're going to see that radical purpose continues in our passage today. Now that radical purpose, let's not forget that God or that Jesus gave his apostles back in Acts chapter 1 is found in Acts 1:8. Jesus said, "You will be my witnesses." And today as we continue in Acts chapter 3, we're going to see the result of living with the purpose that God has for our lives. So, if you have your copy of God's Word, let's turn or swipe together to Acts chapter 3. Uh, we're, we're going to read a big bulk of Scripture today. So, if you're able, let's stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to start at Acts chapter 3 verse 1, and we're going to end in Acts chapter 4 verse 22. So, let's begin Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a lame man from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong, and leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our power or piety we have made him walk? 
the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, the what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the peoples who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaimed these days, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, And in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Chapter 4, verse 1, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed, because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about five thousand verse five on the next day their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in jerusalem with annas the high priest and caiaphas and john and alexander and all who were of the high priestly family and when they had set them in the midst they inquired by what power or by what name did you do this then peter filled with the holy spirit said to them Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a noble sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go. 
finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated at this time. All right, that's a lot, right, that we need to pack in here in the next 30 minutes. So let's spend some time in prayer just between you and God at this time and ask God to speak to you today from his word and from the preaching of his word. We take some time silently to pray where you're at at this time. Father, you have gathered us together today to worship you. And God, we worship you today through prayer, through fellowship, through singing, through hearing your word, and through hearing the preaching of your word. The Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So God, I pray today that as your word is preached, Father, may your spirit lead us, open our hearts, open our minds, try to eliminate any distractions here in person or on our live stream. God, and may your spirit grow us by faith through the preaching of your word. And if there's someone that's not a Christian, and they hear the gospel, the good news of your son, God, I pray that, God, that you will, by your spirit, open their eyes spiritually and help them see their need of you in their life. And may today be the day of salvation. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, so Acts chapter 2, right at the end, we learned that there were many signs and wonders that God was doing through the apostles. Now in Acts chapter 3 today, Luke, the author of Acts, zooms in, if you will. You know, if you have your cell phone out and you want to zoom in on a picture, you know, you just kind of zoom in. This is what Luke is doing. He's zooming in here on an instance between Peter, between John, and between a man who has been unable to walk since his birth. And what we see through Luke's description here from Acts chapter 3 all the way through verse 40, or through verse 22 in Acts chapter 4, are three results of living with purpose that God has for our lives. So we're going to see three results that living with the purpose that God has for our lives. Now, our purpose today is the same as it was for the apostles in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We are called to be witnesses of the resurrected Christ. Okay? That's our purpose as Christians, to be witnesses of the resurrected Christ But God didn't leave us alone. God has empowered us with his spirit to carry out this purpose of being witnesses of the resurrected Christ. So let's let's go ahead, let's jump right in. Let's look at the first purpose that we see here. As we are living purposely, as we have this purposeful living empowered by the spirit, we see that this purposeful living gives birth to life change. This is the first point I want us to see. Purposeful living empowered by the Spirit gives birth to life change. So in verses 1 through 11, we see that Peter and John are walking up to the temple at the hour of prayer. That's about the time between 3 o'clock in the afternoon until about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. This is about the time they're going up. And here in this passage, this is a reminder that the early church is glued to prayer. Remember, we've talked about this since the very first chapter. The early church is glued to prayer. We see this example. Peter and John are going up at the hour of prayer. Purposeful living without prayer results in purposeless living. Catch that purposeful living without prayer results in purposeless living. On their way to the temple, they noticed a man who was laying at the entrance of the gate, here at the entrance of the temple. This man's around 40 years old. He has been laid at the entrance of the temple all of his life, it tells us. 
and he's waiting to receive donations from those who are entering in to the temple. He notices Peter and John entering into the temple, and he asks of donations. He asks of alms, if you will. Peter says, look at us. The man then anticipates. He is ready to receive a donation. He's ready to receive some alms that day. Yet because Peter and John, because they were living with purpose, and because they were empowered by the Spirit to live with the purpose that Jesus had given them, the result here is life-changing for this man. What we see here in Luke's narrative, here in Acts chapter 3, is that life change happened by the authority of Jesus. Look at what Peter told the man. He said, I have no silver and gold. He must, yeah, he, he said, I have no silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter then takes the man by the right hand and he lifts him up. And this man who had never walked a day in his life received life change this day. As his ankles and his feet were strong, they received strength. Here in this description, life change happened this day in the name of Jesus, or it happened in the authority of Jesus. Now it's true, Jesus had ascended into the sky on a cloud. Jesus is no longer in their sight here in Acts chapter 3, but Jesus still remains at the center of their lives. Jesus is not an afterthought in the lives of the apostles. Jesus is not, he is not faded into the background here of the apostles. He is still in the forefront. He is still at the center of the lives of the apostles. And by the authority of Jesus, this man received radical change in his life. You see, radical change will not happen in your life. Radical change will not happen in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world, if Jesus is not at the center. I read this week, over 77% of United States citizens identify as Christians. Yet statistics show that over 195 million Americans are unchurched. Did you know that America is the fifth largest global mission field in the world. Out of, this, out of all the continents on this earth, North America is the only continent where Christianity is on the decline. We're not talking other places right here in our backyard. America is the, or North America is the only continent where Christianity is on the decline. What that sounds like is that we've lost interest in our purpose. It sounds like Jesus is no longer the center. Let me ask you today, has Jesus become an afterthought in your life? Have you lost the wonder of the cross? Have you forgotten about the power of the resurrection. Have you forgotten that the power of the Holy Spirit lives within you? Have you become disinterested in living with this purpose that God has for your life? Look, real life change is needed today. It's needed in our world, it's needed in our community, it's needed in our homes, and real life change that is truly needed will only come when by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus is lifted up. When Jesus becomes the center, and when Jesus is the center of our lives, when he is the center of our church, then real life change will happen, and God will receive the glory. That's what happens here in verse 8. Look at verse 8 again. This man, who had never walked a day in his life, is leaping up. He stood and began to walk, 
And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, those who were lame in this culture, in this time period, they couldn't work. So they had to make a living on donations, on receiving alms. So they would be out by the temple and in other places waiting to receive a donation. But they also couldn't worship. They couldn't enter into the temple and worship. So they would remain on the outside. And all they could do is watch. As people would walk by, go into the temple and worship God. But on this day, this man, his ankles and his feet received strength. And his life changed. And this led to this man then leaping, giving God praise and glory. What motivated Peter and John to have a conversation with this guy? What was their motivation in stopping and talking with this guy? Remember I read the quote at the beginning of the sermon today? The quote was like this. Without a compelling reason or without a why to persist, we lose interest. We become distracted. Or we forget what we purposed to do. Like the lives of Peter and John, they've been radically changed. But in the busyness of their schedule, right, and, their, and, and how jam-packed their schedule is, it could have been easy for them to become distracted. Or even to forget their purpose. And let's not forget, they're glued to prayer. They're walking into the temple to pray, to do a spiritual Thing. It would have been easy for them to walk past this guy who had been lame from his mother's room and to go do a spiritual thing, right? It would have been easy for them to do. But for Peter and John, their purpose, their being witnesses of the resurrected Christ, that was the driving factor. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, that was their driving factor in making decisions for their lives. And their motivation for making these decisions was the glory of God. Their motivation was the praise of God. Let me ask you today, what is your compelling reason? What is your motivation for being a Christian? Why are you a Christian? What's your motivation for continuing to live the Christian life? The Bible teaches we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. We stand justified in the sight of God for the glory of God. The glory of God is our motivation as Christians. The glory of God is why we try to fulfill the purpose that God has given us. The glory of God is why we gather here on Sunday mornings to worship God. It's their motivation. This is why we gather on Sunday mornings. The glory of God is why we serve God here at the church and in the community. It's why we knock down a wall in the youth room so that our youth can gather to glorify God. The glory of God is the motivation in our marriage, in the singleness for some. The glory of God should be our motivation in parenting. The glory of God is our motivation at work, at our school. Paul said, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So here, what they are doing is they're Fulfilling the purpose, empowered by the Spirit, but their motivation is, in is the glory of God. That's what leads to life change here for this man. And what we see in this passage is when life change happens for the glory of God, other people will notice this. Did you notice in verses 9 through 11 that the people saw this man jumping up and down, leaping and praising God? They recognized him. They were filled with wonder. They're filled with amazement. Look, gadgets, gizmos, programs, events, tricks, 
That's not what's needed for real life change to happen today. The what's needed today is for men, women, boys, and girls to live their life with the purpose that God has given them of being witnesses of the resurrected Christ, empowered by the Spirit, and motivated for the glory of God. Now, let's continue. That's just the first 11 verses, right? I need to get you guys out of here to go to Sunday school. Let's move on. Let's look at verses 12 all the way through verse 4 of chapter 4. This is the second point I want us to see today purposeful living empowered by the spirit of god points others to biblical hope now this, this guy's healed and the people are amazed the crowd kind of gathers together and what does the holy spirit lead peter to do look at verse 12 and when peter saw it when he saw the crowd he addressed the people and stopped there peter takes notice and he addresses the people Let's kind of quickly run through how Peter addresses the people. He first points out the consequence of their sin. Now, Peter starts out by saying it wasn't our own strength or our own might that made this man, uh, that made this man well, but it was by the power of God. But Peter then recognizes the seriousness of this situation. These people are guilty. These people are guilty before God. Look at verse 14. Peter said, You denied the holy and righteous one, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life. Ouch, right? They chose someone who brought death to those around them. And Peter says they killed the one who offers eternal life to all. Peter says, you're guilty of breaking the sixth commandment. You shall not murder. And they're going into the temple between three and four in the afternoon to pray, to offer sacrifice. And Peter declares, you are guilty. Those who don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior are guilty sound harsh, sound mean, but they've chosen death over life. Let me ask you today, is this something you want your loved one, your friend, your neighbor, is this what you want for them? Is this someone who doesn't know God? Do you want them to live their life standing guilty before God? Like if you knew someone was driving on a road, and it's a nice, smooth road, but you knew just a few miles down the road, there's this cliff. And you knew they were driving in the dark and heading towards this cliff. What would you do? Stand by the way? Kind of wave at them? You know, as they drive by, heading towards the cliff? Or would you, with all measures, any measures that you had, Stand, waving, warning them, telling them there's danger ahead and there's another way. There's another way that you can go. Well, this is what Peter does exactly in this passage. He points the people to another way. He points them to Jesus. Look at verse 15. God raised Jesus from the dead, and to this we are witnesses. Remember Acts 1.8? And his name, Peter said, by faith in his name, has made this man strong whom you see and know. Now, Peter lets the people know here in his address that God told beforehand that Jesus would suffer and that he fulfilled what God had promised. People point, or Peter here points the people to the hope of Jesus. Our community, our nation, our world, desperately needs to hear about the hope of Jesus. Those who have not placed their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, they are guilty. They will stand before God guilty. They're choosing death over the author of life. 
They are facing the consequence for their sin. The wrath of God will be poured out. And those who don't know Jesus are facing God's justice. Are we going to kind of stand by the wayside and wave at them as they continue towards this path? Or are we going to point them to Jesus? You know, once Peter points them to Jesus here, he also points them towards repentance. The word repent means to change. It means to turn. This is what we've been talking about since Acts 1. Life change, right? Life change. Life change still happens today. And many of you have experienced that. You've experienced life change in your life. You've repented of your sins. And you realize today that you can't experience life change on your own strength. You can't repent. You can't turn. You can't change on your own strength. But God has provided his spirit that will provide life change. Now, for those of you who aren't Christians today, Jesus paid the penalty for your sin. If you're not a Christian today, Jesus paid the penalty for your sin in his, through his death, and his life offers eternal life. There's hope for you. And today, you can experience true life change. I say this every week. First, admit to God that you're a sinner and repent. Repent. Tell God through prayer that you believe that Jesus died on the cross, that he came back to life, and through prayer, confess that Jesus is your Savior and Lord. And the Bible says you will be saved. You will receive life change. And in Acts chapter 4, we read today that over 5,000 believed and repented that day. And as amazing as that is, what we finally see today, our final point in our sermon today, is that purposeful living empowered by the Holy Spirit will face opposition. Purposeful living empowered by the Holy Spirit will face opposition. Verses 5 through 22, those religious leaders, they were greatly annoyed. I love how uh, Luke words that. They were greatly annoyed. So Peter and John, they're put in prison for the night, and the next day, they're summoned to stand before the religious leaders, those rulers, the scribes, and the elders here. What we're seeing here is opposition to the purpose that they've been given. Simply because we've received life change, and simply because our lives have been redeemed for the glory of God, does not mean we will have our best life now. By the way, it's the title of a popular book. Don't read it, okay? It's a popular Christian book. Okay, don't read it. Just because we've been saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus doesn't mean that our path to heaven will be filled with roses and little doilies. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. If you're living, if you are living with radical purpose in your life, you're going to face opposition. Now, you may not be put in prison like what happened here in Acts chapter 4, but persecution is going to come if you're living with radical purpose. And if the church is living out our mission to be witnesses, and if our church is motivated by the glory of God, then people will say all manner of nasty and hateful things about the First Baptist Church of Carmine. Jesus said in Luke 21, verses 16 through 19, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But even in the middle of the opposition, Peter and John were empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not leave us in our time of need. The Spirit will help us see, even though we have opponents, and even though they're opposing the purpose that we've been given, 
our opponents stand in need of life change. Peter and John here use this opportunity to explain to the religious leaders or their opponents that they were also guilty. But he also explained they can receive life change through Jesus. Look at verse 11. Peter said, there's salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. The biblical hope offered that day, that amazed the opponents of Peter and John. And when we live our lives empowered by the Holy Spirit and we live with radical purpose that we've been given, our opponents will recognize the radical change in our lives. They notice the boldness of Peter and John. But they noticed that they were uneducated. That means that they were uneducated in Jewish literature. They also recognized that they were common men, or they were, they were lay persons, if you will. But they recognized they had been with Jesus. They recognized this radical change in their life. But even though they noticed this change, the opponents to the purpose wanted to silence the purpose. But the Spirit led the apostles towards obedience. Now their opponents here, the religious leaders, they warned Peter and John, just keep silent, stop teaching in the name of Jesus, so they threatened them. But this is what Peter said, and I paraphrase here in verse 19, we can't help, we cannot help but speak about the radical change that has taken place in our lives. Has your life been radically changed because of Jesus? If so, you have been given a purpose. If so, you've been given power through the Holy Spirit to live your life for the purpose that you've been given. Look, you are a light for your family. You're a light for your family. You're a light for your school. You're a light for the earned community. You're a light for your coworkers, your job. You're a light for the world. In your family, our community, your job, your school, they need hope today. But there, and we know there are many within our culture who wants to keep us silent, right? They want to keep the purpose that God has given us silent. But I know that the Spirit today is urging, is calling some of you towards obedience to the purpose that you've been given. Let me ask you today, how are you going to respond to the Spirit's leading and guiding in your life? Like God's not calling you to be another Peter or John, but God is calling you towards obedience. Luke here has given us a description of what happened here in the early church, that God may be using you, God may be calling you to live your purpose with your family. God may be calling you to live your purpose at your school, at your job, in the community, maybe even the world. Purposeful living, empowered by the Holy Spirit, gives birth to change. What that means is, Purposeful living multiplies life change. Today, I want to encourage you. Let life change begin with you. Let life change begin with you. Today, I want to encourage our, I want to encourage our church family. Let life change begin with us. Maybe you're fearful of the opponents that you may face as we go out into our mission field. Maybe you're afraid of the opponents. Let me encourage you. Pray for your opponents. They need biblical hope. They need the hope of Jesus. Lift them up in prayer. They need Jesus. Maybe you just simply want to respond today by praying for our church. I want to encourage you, obey the Spirit. If the Spirit's urging you, calling you to pray for our church, obey the Spirit. Pray for our church. Pray that we will keep Jesus at the center of all that we do here at First Baptist Church. May Jesus be the center of the decisions we make. May Jesus be the center of the programs and the events. All that we do, may Jesus be the center. Pray that our motivation for fulfilling the purpose that we've been given, may 
may our church be motivated by the glory of God. And if you're not a Christian today, and you're trying to have this life change on your own, it's not going to happen. You need Jesus. You're standing guilty before God today. And let me encourage you today. Today is the day of salvation. There is salvation in no other name. For in the name of Jesus, the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Let's bow our heads this morning. I want to pray for us. If you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you today through prayer. Admit to God that you're a sinner. Through prayer, tell God that you believe that Jesus died, that he came back to life again, and through prayer, confess that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, and you will be saved. So during this invitation time, I want to encourage you to do that. And if you're a Christian today, and maybe you are just feeling led by the Spirit to fulfill the purpose that God has given you, today I want to encourage you to be obedient to what the Spirit is calling you. Pray during this invitation time. Ask God to give you courage and boldness. And if you want to pray for our church, that we will keep Jesus at the center, I want to encourage you to do that as well. Father, 